everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast addressing NGS dead zones with third generation PAC biosequencing, presented by Dr. Jonas Porlock, Chief Scientific Officer at Pacific Biosciences. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational virtual conference presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Here's how this presentation will work today. If you want to hear from you, questions, comments, even answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone, but if not, we will make sure to follow up with you by email. You can also enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon at the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you cannot hear this presentation or see it, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button at the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Let's now introduce today's speaker. Welcome, sir, Dr. Jonas Porlock. Uh, thank you very much, Susie, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jonas Korlach, and I would like to tell you today how third-generation PEC biosequencing can address some of the more difficult regions in the genome uh, for DNA sequencing. I uh, borrowed the term NGS dead zones from uh, an original research article um, that uh, was published by Birgit Funke and others in uh, Genetics in Medicine entitled Navigating Highly Homologous Genes in a Molecular Diagnostic Setting, a Resource for Clinical Next Generation Sequencing. And in this paper, they point out that while next generation sequencing has been uh, tremendously successful, there are genes and regions in the genome that are much more difficult to get at. Uh, the GenCode project identified over 11,000 unique pseudogenes uh, to date. And um, the discrimination between pseudogenes and the gene of interest uh, can, in many cases, be challenging for short-read next-generation sequencing and also for Sanger sequencing. And so what that brings about is a risk of false positive and false negative variant calls uh, because there could be an accurate mapping of the short reads to the highly homologous regions, including pseudogenes. Basically, because the reads are short, you don't know where they came from, uh, whether they came from the gene and the pseudogene. And um, so in this paper, then, there are a number of tables, uh, for example, this one, where uh, quite a number of clinically important uh, genes that have been recognized to cause uh, genetic diseases are tabulated that uh, are grouped into what they, the authors termed NGS dead zone, meaning that they are um, difficult or impossible to get at and uh, fully resolved with uh, either NGS, and there's another table also with Sanger sequencing. And so um, what I'd like to tell you about today is how um, a different sequencing technology, long read PEC biosequencing, can overcome some of these challenges and um, fulfill opportunities that go beyond the, um, um, uh, the paradigm of having you know, a, a 200 or 300 base pair a piece of DNA that you would like to sequence. In many cases, uh, you would like to do uh, something that goes um, beyond that. So, I will talk about um, full-length phase gene sequencing, where the entire gene is being represented and sequenced and phased into the two alleles from the mother and from the father allele uh, to identify and phase the heterozygous SNPs, as well as maybe larger uh, structure variations, an example of which is shown here. Uh, then already talked about uh, discriminating a gene from a very similar pseudogene and confidently assigning the mutations coming from either the gene or the pseudogene. Uh, extreme sequence context, very uh, GC-rich or AT-rich um, or low-complexity sequences, like repeat expansions. And um, I won't have time to talk today about minor variant detection and methylation detection, and so I'd like to give some examples of uh, where PEC biosequencing has been used to get a much better insight into gene sequencing uh, in these first three examples. Uh, now, very briefly um, about uh, PEC biosequencing, the way this is achieved is through the um, different performance characteristics of um, single molecule real-time sequencing. 
that PEGBAR provides, you may know that uh, we have very long reads, uh, coupled with a very high consensus accuracy, uniform, unbiased coverage, regardless of what the GC percentage or the sequence is, you get uh, high quality data and then uh, the ability to uh, determine DNA modification. So the combination of these, and for this, for the purposes of this talk, uh, the combination of the first three enable addressing these dead zones that are currently exist in NGS or Sanger sequencing. I do want to spend just a, a moment talking about the consensus accuracy in smart sequencing. This has been described and demonstrated in many papers, um, and so here's just one example of um, the first paper a quotation. These authors use smart sequencing to identify uh, DNA mutations in HIV treatment infected individuals. And they chose smart sequencing because for them it exceeded the accuracy achieved by other sequencing methods and uh, was able to provide for them greater than 99.999% accuracy. So how is that done? Um, you may know that on the individual read level, the error is higher in smart sequencing. However, the errors are random, so as you build consensus by uh, building up coverage, um, so may, uh, multiple molecules are being sequenced, uh, mapped to a reference genome or in the de novo assembly, um, um, overlapped um, de novo, um, and then from the uh, consensus you can then determine whether they were homozygous or heterozygous SNPs, so this would be the mode of using it for genotyping and Mendelian diseases, and because the errors are random, they wash out very, very rapidly, so the consensus sequence uh, is highly accurate, uh, greater than 99.999% or QB50. Um, I, I do want to mention that in smart sequencing, there's a special mode of sequencing that we call um, circular consensus sequencing. And in this particular mode, um, the DNA polymerase um, goes around the circular smart bell, around the hairpin adapter, sequencing the reverse strand of that same molecule, and then when the polymerase gets to the primer, it will displace the primer and the DNA has just synthesized and will go into this rolling circle mechanism, um, rolling circle synthesis mechanism, whereby you now get um, multiple subreads that come from the same molecule. So if this technology is possible to sequence the same base of the same DNA molecule multiple times, forward and reverse strand that's unique to smart sequencing, no other technology can provide such high resolution on and accuracy on individual molecules, and so then you get a very highly accurate consensus sequence from that particular molecule by averaging the subreads. And so this would be used in minor variant detection where, for example, in the viral space or in cancer, you have uh, mutations that only exist, let's say, at a 1% frequency in a background of 99% wild type and so forth. In either case, this is how the consensus accuracy develops with respect to depth of sequencing. And so you can see that at about 20 to 30 fold coverage, um, PECBio reaches um, QV40 or 99.99% and then around 50 or 60 fold coverage, it crosses QV50, 99.999% or less than one error in 100,000 bases. So this is a, a way to get extremely accurate sequence, both in a multi-molecule way that's commonly done for Mendelian diseases, as well as on the single molecule level. And uh, tightly coupled with accuracy is the question of whether all sequence contexts can be sequenced uh, to that same level, and that is not the case with um, Sanger sequencing or short read um, sequencing. For example, in, uh, in a recent, in an article last year, uh, two years ago, there was a comparison, a review article, showing that the Illumina technology has coverage bias relative to GC-rich or AT-rich regions, and that's not present in PEC biosequencing, where uh, one gets uniform coverage and sequence quality regardless of the DNA sequence context. So then I would like to, as I mentioned in the beginning, would like to give you some examples where these characteristics have been leveraged for getting better um, and more comprehensive gene sequencing, targeted sequencing, addressing some of those NGS dead zones. Um, the first example is in HLA typing, and I won't um, say much about this because it's been published on and is now well established. Uh, this is a very nice review paper. If you're interested to learn more about this, HLA typing for the next generation by Steve Marsh at uh, Anthony Nolan. Histogenetics um, is, has typed um, over 150,000 samples last year alone 
And uh, so this is a well-established uh, method and the new gold standard in HLA typing where you now can uh, interrogate and fully phase the entire HLA, both class one and class two genes. I want to speak a little bit more detail about one example in the area of drug metabolism and pharmacogenetics. Um, that is a gene that um, is uh, called CYP2D6, um, a uh, cytochrome P450 that's um, very uh, prominently involved in metabolizing medicines and drugs. This CYP2D6 is estimated to metabolize about a quarter of all currently used and available drugs uh, in the Western world. And of course, it matters um, with regard to your CYP2D6 genotype on whether the patient will be a, a very rapid metabolizer of that particular drug or maybe a poor metabolizer. And so, of course, that's of critical importance to the dosage and the um, requirements for particular patients, which can vary by maybe a, as much as an order of magnitude. And so if you are, um, if a doctor would prescribe um, a dose to a patient that has a poor metabolizer that's too high, there's a risk of an overdose. For a rapid metabolizer, if the, if the dose is too low, then the drug may be ineffective. And um, the CYP2D6 gene is very polymorphic, uh, similar to HLA, so it's been difficult to fully characterize. Uh, and in a series of two papers, um, first by researchers at Mount Sinai, describing long-read single-molecule real-time full gene sequencing of cytochrome um, p 452 d 6 and then more recently by a group in Europe, um, also describing flexible and scalable full-length CYP2D6 amplicon sequencing. They describe how this particular NGS dead zone can now be uh, fully and comprehensively interrogated. There was a nice article by Stuart Scott um, in uh, Drug Discovery Magazine um, describing that a little bit more broadly. So uh, in this first paper, um, Stuart Scott and colleagues first looked at 10 samples that they had previously characterized with the more indirect assays like the Luminex assay or the TACMAN copy number assay, and then compared it to smart, the smart sequencing assay. In uh, several cases, it was possible with smart sequencing to refine the genotype. Um, there was a characterization of duplication allele and then even in those control samples, he found novel alleles that were missed with the other uh, assays. And then he went on to 14 samples that had discrepant results between the other genotyping platforms. And similarly, he was able with smart sequencing to resolve the suballeles, refine the genotypes, find allele duplications, and in one case, find a completely novel tandem rearrangement that had never been seen before. In the second paper from the European group, uh, they described similar results, sequencing the full 6.6 .6 kb fragment covering the entire gene, including the up and downstream regions. And in addition, they describe a two-step barcoding scheme, which is very efficient to move from one locus to another. So two primers are used um, that have a universal M13-based tail on both ends. They are used to uh, amplify the particular region of interest. And then um, in a second step PCR, barcodes are added that allow them to multiplex and pool many different samples together, which makes it cost efficient. And this two-step protocol allows you to move very uh, efficiently to another locus because all you need, if you want to now look at a different gene, is just two primers, specific primers with the same tails. They would amplify locus two, and then the second um, step PCR stays the same and uh, uh, allows for pooling without the need uh, for significant additional investments if you want to move to another target. In general, I want to uh, just mention that there is a uh, difference in the overall design with PecBio that's afforded by having long reads. Uh, as you um, probably well know with short read or Sanger uh, sequencing, as the gene of interest gets maybe be beyond 500 or 1,000 bases, you need multiple primers and multiple reactions to walk yourself through this region. That's not the case in PEC biosequencing because up to about 10 KB, and I'll even show some examples that are go beyond that, it's possible to just um, interrogate the entire region with just one primer pair, one long range PCR that that's fully sequenced then. And then similar to other technologies, we have uh, a set of 384 barcodes that have been optimized for smart sequencing that allow the multiplexing and pooling of hundreds of targets and samples, and the software will automatically demultiplex the molecules that are being sequenced 
and then analyze uh, them separately in each bin uh, for the barcode appropriately. So then what about going beyond uh, what can be looked at with PCR? Um, we and our, our users have tested um, probe-based capture techniques, uh, IDT or NimbleGen, um, that depending on the particular design um, may be preferable. And uh, what you can see, the difference here now is though, compared to short read sequencing, is that um, 5 KB or so um, fragments in length are being pulled down and sequenced in a continuous fashion compared to the uh, 200 or so base pair fragments that you get with, um, for example, the Illumina platform. And so this is a, a standard NimbleGen oncology panel. Um, so these are genes that are, play a, a critical role in cancer. And uh, this is um, a gene um, MUTHY that's involved in DNA repair, a, a very important cancer gene. And you can see the difference that uh, here, down here in this IGB view, that's the gene with the exons in um, blue rectangles. And then the PEC bio data is up on top and the uh, corresponding Illumina data is on the bottom. So the probes are only um, targeting the exons. And so that's why you only have coverage in these particular regions, whereas the gene is fully covered um, with PEC bio. And you can see um, SNPs, homozygous and then heterozygous here. There are larger uh, insertions or deletions, in this particular case an insertion, that can be uh, viewed. And it's because the reads are long, it then allows you to phase uh, the reads into the two haplotypes. I show this by example here for another uh, gene region. This is exon 10 of BRCA1. And uh, you can then now order these reads very easily by phasing um, the SNPs the heterozygous SNPs, and so very easily identify allele 1 reads and allele 2 reads and build a consensus, whereas that's not possible uh, with the short read uh, MySeq data. And of course, phasing these heterozygous mutations is critical in some cases. For example, in cancer and tumor suppressor genes, you have this classical two-hit hypothesis that both copies of the tumor suppressor gene have to have mutations um, so that their function is knocked out. And so it's of critical interest um, to a clinician to know whether the observation of two mutations come from um, the two different alleles. Um, in this particular case, both alleles, both copies of the tumor suppressor gene would be defective versus having those two mutations uh, both occurring on one copy, on one allele, which means that the other allele is still intact, uh, which has implications for the uh, tumor progression and the uh, diagnosis. And uh, uh, in addition, um, it is possible to resolve larger structure variations. So here's another example of a uh, cancer-related gene. And uh, the PEC bio data very clearly show here in one of the alleles, there is a 740 base pair deletion. In the other, it is not, in the other it is present. And that was not picked up with the Illumina data. This, this particular deletion uh, comprises and contains an entire exon of that particular gene but that was not um, detected with the short read technologies. Now then, um, coming back maybe to the um, uh, title inspiration of my seminar today, Discriminating Genes and Pseudogenes. Um, CYP2D6 was actually already an example of this because CYP2D6 has uh, a neighboring pseudogene that has 97% uh, homology. And because now the reads are longer, there's more flexibility in where you can place your primers and being unique to the gene so that pseudogene contamination is less of a problem. So in this study, no high identity off-target sequence alignments were observed because all the amplification products came from the gene with unique primers compared to uh, the pseudogene. Um, and so a second example, for going back to this list of NGN dead zone uh, genes is PMS2, um, which is responsible for a form of colon cancer. PMS2 has a very large region of uh, over 99% similarity to its corresponding pseudogene. And uh, in a collaboration, we uh, determined uh, the sequence, full sequence of a 17 KB amplicon uh, that extends over this region. There was no mapping to the pseudogene because again, um, all the um, amplicon molecules came from the gene. And then our automated long amplicon analysis or LAA tool uh, that's part of smart analysis can be used to then fully phase into the two alleles. This is a screenshot for two samples, the wild type sample and then a mutant sample. 
and you can see over the entire uh, region of 17 kilobases, uh, this is fully phased and fully resolved. Uh, there was a recent paper that I think highlights another general opportunity to improve and uh, optimize uh, the sequencing of genes that currently is very cumbersome and only incomplete. Um, this comes from uh, Yaya Anwar and colleagues in Europe and was just published in Human Mutation. Uh, they were looking at a gene called PKD1, which is implicated in this kidney disease. And the clinical standard right now is to do um, a number of long-range PCR um, reactions followed by about 40 or 50 nested PCR reactions that um, specifically target the exons of that uh, gene uh, to get at the, uh, this is to get at the single nucleotide variation. And then that is uh, then combined with a multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification or MLPA. So that's a, uh, another additional assay that is run for looking at larger structure variation. In the paper, he shows that single molecule real-time sequencing can get at um, this particular gene in a much more efficient and optimized fashion. Five long-range PCR uh, reactions were run. And then these products are sequenced um, in their entirety. These are about four or five kilobase fragments that are sequenced in one piece, uh, encompassing all the exons and, and uh, intronic um, spanning regions and um, lead to a much um, more efficient workflow because also uh, the MLPA assay is not needed. You get both the um, single nucleotide variation as well as the larger structure variation from uh, the sequencing with PecBio. And so they found excellent concordance, uh, over 95% concordance with the Sanger results, and there were several variants um, that were detected uh, with PecBio that were missed with the Sanger um, technology. So there are many uh, examples of genes that are currently, as a standard test, being subjected to this combination of Sanger sequencing and MLPA assays that, um, as I said, are cumbersome, involve multiple assays, are laborious and, and fairly expensive, that uh, have a good potential to be replaced by a much more efficient PEC bioassay. And I, I want to close this section by just making a general point that um, on the websites, these types of assays uh, currently are advertised as uh, so-called full gene analysis, but you will uh, appreciate from what I talked before that often it is not actually looking at the full gene. So it's really most often a full exon analysis and maybe uh, with uh, the uh, junctions between the exons and the introns. But um, that's different with PecBio. With PecBio, there's a potential um, to interrogate the entire gene, all the exons, all the introns, and uh, detect all the variants, um, and including intronic variants that uh, in some cases may not be clinically actionable or relevant, but um, splice variants can certainly be um, detected this way. It also provides a better uh, discrimination of pseudogenes because number one, with the long reads, there are more variants in a given sequence read, which allows you to better identify whether that read came from a gene or this corresponding pseudogene, and the intronic variation also can help you uh, discriminate that. So I just want to give one example highlighting this point, again going back to PMS2. So in the region of the segmental duplication uh, between PMS2 versus the corresponding pseudogene, PMS2CL, within the exons, it's 99.2% identical. However, over the uh, span of this entire region, it's 98.2% identical. So there's an entire percentage point of difference that helps you if you sequence the entire region to identify where those reads were coming from. And uh, in particular, in one, as one example uh, that I'm going to mark right here, so this exon down here uh, is 100% identical between the gene and the pseudogene. So if you just sequence the exon, you would not be able to tell whether it came from the gene or the pseudogene but you see all the red marks flanking this particular region. So if you sequence a larger region around the exon, it will be possible to very confidently place those reads and identify where they came from. Um, I want to move on to extreme sequence context. So AT-rich regions, an example is the TOM40 gene, which has been implicated in uh, a risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is um, a, being developed as a biomarker for the risk of Alzheimer's. 
And uh, there's a clinical trial uh, with Takeda Pharmaceuticals and Zinfandel, a large clinical trial, thousands of subjects looking at um, this particular region. Um, the TOM40 gene has a um, poly-T tract that's uh, shown here of uh, uh, 35 Ts in the reference genome. And uh, the expansion or truncation of this particular poly-T stretch can have an effect on the risk of developing Alzheimer's. So uh, this is a view of how uh, this particular region looks with PecBio. And you can see that um, the reads fully span this particular region. And if you look very closely, you can see that there's really two groups of reads present. I'm going to reorder the same data to uh, make this a little more clear. So you can see half of the reads have a, uh, a region that is um, short, that only has a portion of the red bars, which are the Ts, followed by a deletion. And half the reads have a stretch of Ts that is very similar in length to the reference. And so then you can use the consensus caller to identify the two alleles. So allele 1 has 15 Ts. Allele 2 has 34 Ts in this particular sample compared to the reference of 35 Ts. And these are the kinds of polymorphisms that are quite difficult, even with Sanger technology, to resolve. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, GC-rich regions. This is an example for uh, Fragile X syndrome in the fml one gene. Um, Paul Hageman and colleagues had uh, demonstrated quite a while back that PEC biosequencing allows for sequencing through these very GC-rich uh, regions of DNA. More recently, um, a paper has appeared looking at AGG interruptions specifically. And uh, these interruptions of, an AGG, of one or two AGGs in this sea of CGGs has a big impact on the risk from a, of a mother giving birth to uh, a son that would have the full fragile X syndrome. Um, so 80% risk with zero AGGs going down to 15% having two AGGs in this particular uh, length of the CGG repeats. So it has tr uh, significant implications on prenatal uh, testing, on parental counseling, and so forth to know exactly what the uh, repeat expansion is and what the sequence therein is. So um, in a paper uh, late last year by Joris Vermeesh and colleagues in Europe, um, it was described that single molecule real-time sequencing provides a very robust and powerful assay to detect these AGG interruptions in uh, these fml one premutation carriers. They used um, the circular consensus sequencing to identify molecules and then in a de novo fashion identify and um, characterize the AGG interruptions and in some cases um, resolving um, situations which were quite difficult from, um, which were difficult or impossible to get at with other technologies. So they um, certainly envision that this method facilitates the research and the diagnostic analysis for this particular repeat expansion. Now, more generally, there are many repeat expansion diseases, uh, neurological diseases that have at their heart uh, as a causative variant a, an expansion of a low complexity sequence like a trinucleotide or tetranucleotide repeat. And some of these can't even be amplified with uh, PCR. In the previous um, paper, this was still possible. Um, but some of these are not um, readily amplified with PCR or other amplification techniques. And for this reason, we, have, um, we are in the process of developing an amplification-free target enrichment that uses the Cas9 enzyme and its guide RNA mechanism for targeting and cutting a particular region out of the genome. And so then in this um, workflow where you first make a normal smart bell library, then target your region of interest with the Cas9 enzyme, and then subject it to smart sequencing, native DNA would be sequenced. So there's no amplification step involved, which then allows you to get at those tricky regions. Um, and also because of the guide RNAs, it's compatible um, to look at multiple targets. And of course, it's uh, amenable to barcoding. So you can imagine a, a gene panel for repeat expansion disease targets. And uh, we've done a, a test uh, run targeting four of these diseases in, one same, in the same reaction. This is Huntington's disease, um, Fragile X uh, syndrome, FMR1, the ALS locus, that's Lou Gehrig's disease, and then SCA10 is uh, spinocerebellar ataxia, uh, one of those uh, ataxia diseases. And um, in the bottom graph, you see the human genome. So on the left is chromosome 1, 
and then all the way to chromosome Y. And the Y axis is the number of molecules uh, that were sequenced. And so you can see the annotation, all four targets were um, enriched for and enough molecules were gathered and sequenced to allow for uh, determining a consensus. And so this is then what the uh, visualization looks like on the left for Huntington's disease. The, you see very clearly the two alleles. On the top, there's 18 CAGs um, followed by 10 CGGs. And then on the bottom, uh, 60 CAGs followed by two CGGs. And then on the right graph, FMR1, Fragile X syndrome, uh, on the top uh, mountain there, 13 CGGs with two AGG interruptions. Those are the uh, yellow orange uh, lines. And then the second allele, 119 CGGs with one AGG. So very uh, clear and comprehensive characterization of these particular um, disease types. Now, um, beyond targeted sequencing, I'd like to uh, close my talk today in talking about two other NGS dead zones that are outside of the, the realm of targeted sequencing, but uh, also have been quite difficult uh, and in some cases impossible to characterize with um, next generation sequencing techniques. And here as well, PEC biosequencing offers new solutions and new assays. Um, the first of those two other examples is in the area of full length RNA-seq, um, RNA-seq and um, which we call isoform sequencing or isoseq for short. And um, of course, it's been well recognized that there is a um, tremendous complexity in gene expression where from a given gene, um, there would be many different types of mRNA isoforms that would be uh, formed. It's now estimated, in fact, that over 95% of all human genes are alternatively spliced. And the average number of splice isoforms per gene is estimated to be around eight. So there is this tremendous complexity uh, that's been recognized to be very difficult to resolve with the short read technologies because relying on the reads that span the splice junctions does not carry enough information to then reconstruct the picture above of all the different mRNA isoforms. Uh, in contrast, we've developed a uh, solution we, which we call isoseq for isoform sequencing that uh, uses the um, smarter CloneTech cDNA kit to make full length um, cDNA libraries. And so each molecule, each cDNA molecule represents a full length mRNA that's then sequenced with long read PEC biosequencing. And so the reads coming off the sequencer are automatically full length RNAs. And so there's no assembly required. Um, long reads are not an, enough. You also have to have lack of bias. This was a paper uh, a few years ago uh, by the ABRF consortium comparing the different technologies. So uh, from left to right, uh, the Roche 454, Illumina, then uh, over here, uh, you have the PEC biotechnology, and then on the right, um, the ion torrent, life tech. And uh, what's here on the um, Y-axis is the 5 prime end of the mRNA on the top and then going down to the 3 prime end. And you can see uh, in the heat map that the PEC biotechnology provides a much more even representation over the full length mRNAs. Um, in many cases, in most, in most cases with the other technologies, there's a lack of coverage on the 5 prime end, um, which are commonly GC rich. So coming back to the sequencing bias, which causes problems and causes these dead zones um, in uh, particular transcripts and transcript isoforms. So um, I want to give a couple examples. Um, this one is published. The others will be uh, unpublished. Uh, this was one of the first, and I guess now um, one could say cl classical papers for isoseq, where uh, Wing Wong at Stanford and others looked at the human embryonic stem cell transcriptomes, one of the best characterized transcriptomes, and uh, found that um, the uh, there was a lot of new discovery, 273 new genes, um, and uh, many different isoforms that had not been seen before and uh, had represented uh, an NGS dead zone. And uh, they had concluded in the paper that even the process of identifying all the genes in a human genome, even in these well-characterized uh, human cell lines and tissues was likely far too complete. I wanted to mention this paper because um, more recently, some of those discoveries that were made in that paper, some of those new genes were subjected to a much closer analysis. And uh, so in this paper, 
um, some of these uh, non-coding RNAs that were discovered in the, in the PNAS paper were shown to be critically important to regulating uh, pluripotency uh, during human pre-implantation development and during nuclear reprogramming. So it takes some time to go from a discovery to um, understanding the function, but uh, this paper I think highlighted very nicely that these new discoveries that are now filling out the uh, previous NGS dead zones are not just some uh, less important um, uh, uh, genes and uh, other biological features. They're critically important to understand very um, crucial biological functions. If you want to uh, read more about this, there was a very nice commentary and feature, a technology feature in nature a little while back, finding function in mystery transcripts that uh, sort of tells the story. And also in the area of long non-coding RNAs, uh, this paper is now in the bioarchives by the GenCode Consortium, using smart sequencing to approximately double the number of annotated um, uh, complexity of the target loci, um, generating full-length transcript models um, that um, allow to definitively characterize the genomic feature of these long non-coding RNAs that are notoriously more difficult to characterize and uh, thereby removing a long-standing bottleneck of transcriptome annotation. Previously, this was very uh, cumbersome and uh, required manual quality um, curation and finishing, and this can now be done in an automated manner with uh, high throughput through uh, the use of smart sequencing. So another NGS dead zone could be uh, considered um, the long non-coding RNAs, and those are now also being illuminated by um, PECBio um, third-generation sequencing. Um, a very uh, new paper that's now in press um, is looking at androgen receptor variants. And um, so in prostate cancer, uh, androgen deprivation therapy is currently the standard of care. However, uh, one of the major limitations is the development of resistance. And so there are these castration-resistant prostate cancers, or CRPCs, that remain the uh, second leading cause of male cancer death and the drug resistance is often mediated via the expression of androgen receptor variants. So in this new paper by Scott Dame and colleagues, they use, uh, um, the researchers use smart sequencing to get a better picture of these androgen receptor variants and their expression and how that relates to uh, predicting resistance. So um, the androgen receptor uh, gene structure is shown here and the full-length androgen receptor has eight exons, but then these variants are often truncated and can involve these cryptic exons that are shown here in red and are denoted as, as C, CE5 and CE3. And so in particular, ARV7, uh, uh, which has a CE3 variant, um, truncated uh, cryptic exon, and um, ARV9, which has a CE5, were um, uh, were being looked at. Um, they are constitutively active and uh, uh, often mediate the drug resistance. And so, in fact, ARV7 is, is being developed as a predictive biomarker for primary resistant to these particular therapies in uh, CRPCs, in this type of prostate cancer. And, um, but it had been known that multiple additional uh, variants are expressed, and the extent of which they're co-expressed or predict resistance was not known. And so in the study, the researchers used smart sequencing to look at isoforms of the entire uh, AR uh, gene structure, which is shown in more detail here. There's a large tandem duplication inside the gene that's about 35 kilobases and contains exon 3 and some other uh, cryptic exons in uh, duplicate copies. And so then applying PEC sequencing, isoseq, um, the authors get a very detailed picture of the complexity. And I won't go into this. Uh, in great detail, only to say that each row here is a different isoform that was um, characterized and identified with PECBio. You see on the, um, on the right here in this table that several of them are completely novel, but uh, highlighted here in, um, uh, in the shaded bars, you can see that um, both um, ARV9 here and ARV7 are um, expressed to a large degree. The bar here refers to the abundance. This is just molecular recount. So there, uh, both ARV9 and ARV7 are expressed. And um, both uh, Illumina and PECBio showed uh, this expression. However, 
only with the PEG bio data it was revealed that the three prime terminus of ARV9 is actually located uh, at the end of ex the cryptic exon three uh, with no intervening splicing and that's um, denoted by um, this arrow right here. So everything in the table you see here is red is a new splice, are new splice junctions both on the three prime and the five prime end and refer to uh, new uh, knowledge and new discoveries. So what that meant is that the ARV9 was misannotated previously and the terminal exon is actually much longer than previously annotated. It's, it's about 2.4 KB and uh, whereas previously um, this was, um, this particular isoform was annotated like this with just having the uh, CE5. Now through PEC-BioIsoSeq it's understood that it's actually much longer and encompasses both CE3 in intervening sequence and CE5. That is significant because previous uh, studies have had directly targeted CE3 that's highlighted here with the last arrow with the thought being that it would be specific to ARV7. But now the realization that ARV9 also has that particular cryptic uh, exon 3 um, would justify uh, or would necessitate a reassessment of the data that were used to infer ARV, uh, ARV7 function. So with this more complete isoform information, uh, these data have to be reassessed because anything that um, because both of these are co-expressed, ARV9 and ARV7, um, both mRNAs can be knocked down um, that, uh, by the sRNAs that have been used previously to uh, characterize the ARV7 function. And then uh, it was shown that transfection of cell lines with the siRNAs targeting CA3 reduced the expression of both ARV7 and ARV9 whereas if you target CE5, that was specific to ARV9. So that has critical implications for the previous knowledge about the function and uh, the unknown expression and constitution of ARV9 um, uh, requires now critical reevaluation of um, drug resistance studies and so forth. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through this um, particular uh, example. And uh, only to mention that within the context of ISOSeq, um, we have an improved protocol um, that is now available on the website that has a streamlined workflow, uh, no longer requires a size selection that was previously possible on the R, uh, previously necessary on the RS2, and uh, this is available on our website. And there are many, we see ISOSeq as one of the most um, fast growing areas of use cases for the PEC biotechnology. There are many papers that are now available and growing uh, fairly rapidly. So uh, on our website, there's a publications uh, page where you can look at more examples uh, for ISOSeq. So then lastly, in the area of whole genome sequencing, um, there's another NGS dead zone, as it were, because structure variations have been very difficult to characterize with um, next generation sequencing. Uh, we know that uh, structure variation, so non-SNP variation is widespread and actually accounts for the majority of the genetic variation. So uh, this is a paper from 2007. So 10 years ago, we already recognized that um, uh, there's more structure variation in terms of the number of bases um, than uh, SNP variation. So um, for Craig Venter's genome, it was recognized that 74% of all variant bases are non-SNP DNA variation. So three quarters of all the bases that make you different from me are not in SNPs. And so what do I mean by structure variation? I mean the various types of larger differences between my genome and uh, let's say the reference genome, deletions, tandem duplications, variable number tandem repeats, um, insertions, inversions, and so forth. And um, it's been well recognized uh, in the community now that short read massively parallel sequencing is insufficient to generate high quality genome assemblies and resolve most structural variation. And this was an editorial on the bottom in Nature Genetics entitled Whole Genome Question um, Mark that said that it is now time to stop thinking that merely more DNA sequencing, meaning short read sequencing, will give us the variants that determine human traits. And this, pay, this commentary points out that uh, long read pet biosequencing can uh, get access to that hidden variation that uh, has been an NGS dead zone until now. 
the first example of that uh, demonstration that um, smart sequencing is able to illuminate this particular dead zone came from the lab of Evan Eichler in the Nature paper, um, resolving the complexity of the human genome uh, using smart sequencing. There have been many other papers now, um, either genome-wide or looking at particular regions, highlighting structure variation, and uh, I won't go into those as much, but I do want to uh, comment on one um, a transition that we're now seeing, which is that this is starting to be used in the clinical research uh, context. Uh, this was a collaboration with uh, Ewan Ashley uh, that he presented at the ASHG meeting, looking uh, at a um, patient that had a um, heart problem. So Ewan Ashley is a cardiologist, and uh, he uh, this particular patient had uh, issues with tumors growing in his heart, and uh, he was being considered for heart transplant um, and the clinicians wanted to know um, what the uh, underlying genetic defect was in order to get some, um, uh, get some estimate of how uh, successful the heart transplant might be. So the exome was sequenced with short reads and the genome was sequenced, but the clinical testing came back negative. And so we collaborated to look whether long read PECR sequencing could um, identify the particular variant. Um, just tenfold coverage um, was enough to get a good view of the structure variation map in this particular patient. Um, so this was on the run on the SQL system, identifying about 7,000 deletions, 7,000 insertions, and identifying a 2.1 KB deletion that removes the first coding exon of this particular PRKAR1A gene. Uh, which had previously been in OMEM characterized as causing autosomal dominant carney complex, uh, which fit the phenotype quite well. So uh, through PECAR sequencing, it was possible to identify uh, the particular genetic underlying reason for this particular disease. And uh, this has been described in more detail in a paper by the BioArchives, and um, the paper, I understand, is now formally accepted and should uh, come out in genetics and medicine uh, fairly soon. Now, going beyond um, looking at structure variations against a reference genome, um, we have seen demonstrations and publications on putting together human genomes from scratch in de novo assemblies. So um, ultimately, the reference has been a great um, guiding scaffold and, and a guiding post for the research community, but um, it um, is more difficult to find, for example, the ethnic differences and define sequence that is prevalent in particular ethni ethnicities that's not uh, apparent in the reference genome. And so uh, a number of papers have appeared um, describing the high quality um, PEC bio genome assemblies of a Chinese genome, a Korean genome. Uh, this was a Nature paper last year by So et al, uh, representing the most contiguous diploid human genome assembly to date. Uh, that's the Korean uh, reference genome. And on the right, uh, again, you see here that uh, thousands of novel deletions and novel insertions in particular were identified as part of sequencing that just that one individual and highlighting how much of a dead zone that has been to the detection using short read technologies. So what we are pleased to see is now uh, efforts by the scientific community to establish high quality de novo assemblies using PEC biotechnology. Um, across the different ethnicities all over the globe. And I think that'll be a transformative addition of um, knowledge to uh, our understanding of the complexity of the human genome within the human population. Um, it's fair to say that um, these efforts are um, still a uh, substantial research effort, so it's, it wouldn't be really scalable to um, what would be, um, certainly be the goal more long-term to subject hundreds, uh, thousands, or maybe tens of thousands of individuals to a de novo assembly type um, uh, uh, paradigm. And so uh, with that, um, I want to give some insight into our planned roadmap um, that we believe will deliver that uh, particular type of capability. So um, that's, um, of course, related to throughput. As we increase the throughput on the SQL system per run, um, correspondingly, the cost gets reduced. And so over the next two years, um, we uh, have the following roadmap. In 2017, um, we will increase the throughput per smart cell run by a factor of two. Um, we will uh, repeat that improvement um, um, in the year of 2018, another twofold increase on top of that. And then at the end of 2018, we will 
introduce a new smart uh, cell for the SQL system that has an eightfold increase in the number of uh, ZMWs uh, compared to the one million that's there now to an eight million chip. These performance improvements are multiplicative, so uh, two times two times eight, that's about a factor of 30 increase in the throughput of uh, sequence bases per uh, smart cell run. Um, and that corresponds to um, about 150 gigabases per smart cell when that is uh, realized. Uh, that's about a 50x coverage of a human genome, uh, which will be enough to allow for de novo assembly, like the ones I described. And of course, de novo assemblies in the clinic have been uh, called for by the community and by leading scientists. This was Jim Lupsky um, saying that for him, de novo assemblies in the clinic that would be a goal that uh, he would really, really want to strive for. More recently, Evan Eichler said, uh, if we're still aligning sequences simply, and that's our only way for understanding genetic variation to a reference genome 10 years from now, clinically, I think we failed. What we really need to think about is how to do this right. And that means understanding all the variation from stem to stern in these genomes. So by that, he means the novo assemblies. And of course, the um, difference between a de novo assembly and a uh, so-called whole genome sequence uh, that was done with NGS has been also commented and recognized. This is a very famous graph um, on the left celebrating the cost improvements of what it takes to uh, sequence a human genome. But um, what has been also been noted is that there is a discrepancy between the quantity and the pure cost and the corresponding quality because a genome that was um, sequenced and assembled back here, back then here, was of a different, very different kind of quality from what's being done um, here or then uh, today. In fact, the NHGRI in 2008 changed the very definition of what it means to sequence a human genome to account for just mapping and aligning rather than going to a de novo assembly. And so um, uh, researchers like David Hausler have commented a few years ago, uh, I love these charts that we've been seeing with the Moore's Law, but there's a lot of wishful thinking in there those aren't genomes. And so what uh, we've been living, of course, um, through the last few years is the so-called $1,000 genome. And um, as uh, many recognize, that's uh, largely focused on tabulating the SNPs in, uh, uh, compared to a reference genome. And with the uh, roadmap and with the performance improvements that I've outlined, we believe that at the beginning of 2019, we will have the throughput at a, at a point where that same um, amount of money will give um, a PEC bio genome. However, that will be a real actual um, uh, genome with a de novo assembly characterizing all the um, single nucleotide variation as well as the structure variation. If you're only interested in the structure variation, tenfold coverage is enough, as I mentioned in one of the examples, and that would be a few hundred dollars. And so um, this, I think it's been well recognized for uh, some time that the quality of the PEC biotechnology is there, and it was a throughput and a cost issue. And so um, many have commented that if you can make long reads both at a high quality and also cost effective, then perhaps there wouldn't be a need for the short reads um, for many of these projects, uh, especially in the de novo assembly and population sequencing space. So we are pleased to see that um, this transition is now um, coming to pass uh, and that there are um, institutions, especially in China, uh, getting ready for uh, running large population scale projects using PEC biosequencing, addressing in the NGS dead zones uh, that I mentioned, um, and particularly in population sequencing um, with um, uh, multiple purchase of units and really scaling up the PEC, bio, PEC biosequencing uh, component. So with that, I, will, I would like to close um, and summarize that in all three of these NGS dead zones in targeted sequencing with the various different flavors uh, that I talked about in um, RNA-seq, uh, in characterizing the complexity of transcriptomes, and in the area of detecting and characterizing structural genetic variation, and ultimately leading to a, leading to a de novo assembly, PEC biosequencing has a lot to offer and uh, um, can uh, provide new assays and solutions um, and that lead to new discoveries, new clinical research and tests um, that will benefit um, the patients. So with that, uh, this is my first acknowledgement slide because um, you've seen that most of the things that I talked about were not done by us, 
They were done by the scientific community. And um, 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 so I'd like to express my gratitude um, to the researchers who uh, invest time and effort in uh, applying the technology, driving the technologies forward in many cases, and uh, we're deeply indebted to them for their efforts. Um, also, and this is then the, the manifestation of these efforts, there are now over 2,000 peer review publications, about three to four new papers per day on the use of PEC biosequencing in the various different application areas. And then finally, I'd like to thank all the um, um, staff at PECBio who work hard every day to uh, bring this technology uh, to your research as well. So with that, I'll um, uh, stop and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Horlack, for that informative presentation. We want to begin our Q&A segment. So here's a reminder as to how audience members can communicate with us. Questions can be submitted in the Q&A button at the lower left. If we are unable to get to your question due to time constraints, Dr. Korlak will be answering submitted questions via email. So let's take a look at our first question. Dr. Korlak, can you say a bit more about the practical aspects of carrying out PAC bio-sequencing? Examples like library prep, current sequencing performances, and data analysis. Yes, certainly. I'd be happy to. Um, so with regard to the library preparation, uh, it's um, quite similar in terms of the uh, uh, steps that are needed, the molecular biology, to what um, uh, researchers are used to for Illumina sequencing. So there's ligation steps and the cleanup step, and then you bind polymerase and then goes to sequencing. So we have um, um, protocols on our website that for the different applications, whether it's amplicons or uh, structure variant detection or ISOSeq. I mentioned one of the protocols that's um, in my talk. So we have many more of these types of protocols that in a very detailed fashion outline the steps, all the materials that are needed uh, and the detailed protocols um, step by step to go from the DNA material to the library that would then go in the sequencer. So that's fully supported for um, dozens of different application spaces. Um, it's quite similar to what you would be used uh, to an Illumina, making an Illumina library. Um, we have automated solutions um, on uh, the robotic uh, handling systems. If you have lots of samples um, that uh, would allow you to uh, make that more cost efficient and, and do that in a hands automated, uh, hands on in an automated fashion. Um, and uh, uh, so those solutions are available on our uh, website. With regard to the sequencing itself, um, I did include uh, a slide here. Um, showing the current performance. Uh, we released the latest uh, chemistry was released in January, uh, which is the version 2 chemistry, which uh, typically um, uh, provides in total in terms of throughput about 5 to 8 gigabases per smart cell run. Uh, the average read length, depending on the application, can vary uh, range between 10 and 18 kilobases. I mentioned the high consensus accuracy um, that um, is greater than QE50 at about 50 or 60 fold coverage. Uh, you see on the picture on the right that there is a robotic station in the SQL system which allows the user to run multiple samples and multiple smart cells in an automated uh, walk-away fashion. So up to 16 smart cells can be run in um, a single run. And um, the acquisitions are quite fast. Um, so depending on the use case, the um, movie times, the sequencing runs can be as uh, short as 30 minutes and as long as 10 hours. So compared to other technologies, it's quite rapid. Um, that's because of the real-time nature of the sequencing. And um, so that, that can be quite fast. Um, with regard to data analysis, we have a full uh, software package as part of um, the uh, SQL system. It's called SmartLink that has uh, several modules, um, data uh, management, uh, run QC um, stats that can be pulled up. And then with regard to data analysis, uh, our SmartLink uh, analysis package, which for the different application gives you a user-friendly and user interface um, uh, workflows for uh, Amplicon analysis, Mendelian diseases, for minor variant detection, 
for structure variation detection for de novo assembly and for ISOSEQ, uh, et cetera. So um, there's a full uh, software package that's freely available um, that is there for the users. We do also, of course, have advanced uh, analysis uh, pipelines for expert bioinformaticians that can do more uh, than the user interface, and that's available as well. Thank you, Dr. Korlak. It looks like we have another great question. Who should someone contact if they're interested in purchasing a SQL and or running the PAC bio sequencing? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And um, so we are a, a global organization that has uh, that sells um, uh, the systems globally. And we have sales and support, um, both in terms of instrument support, as well as application support, bioinformatics support, alongside with uh, the sales representatives um, all over the world. And I would say, in general, our website is a great um, uh, gateway to get that information, get in contact with us. So if you go on our website, there are links that uh, give you information about um, the uh, different, there's a contact link. Um, also about uh, service providers, if that is of interest. Uh, we have a, a, a quite a number of service providers all over the world. And so I would say our, our website is a, is a great gateway um, to get more information as well as get in touch with us uh, if you're interested in uh, running PECBIO projects or purchasing a SQL system. like that was all of the questions for today's event. Dr. Korlak, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, thank you, Susie, and, and thanks again for the organizers for giving me the opportunity. I um, was hoping to give a broad overview um, over the different application areas. I had uh, focused on the human biomedical space and of course, there are um, many different other areas that I didn't have time to talk about, microbial, infectious disease, viral um, applications, plant and animal sequencing, et cetera. So if, if uh, you're interested in those, uh, get in touch with us. And so there's um, many different areas that I couldn't, in the interest of time here, talk about. And then also, um, with regard to the things that I did talk about, uh, I'd like to encourage you to um, uh, contact us, and uh, we are, we'd be happy to discuss your particular interests in detail, scoping out and, and uh, uh, guiding the experimental design of what PECBIO might be able to contribute to, re to your research. So by all means, I'd like to uh, encourage you to uh, contact us, and if you have uh, your favorite genes and want to know how to uh, perhaps apply PECBIO, then uh, please get in touch with us, and we'd uh, love to uh, chat with you about that and then scope out what, what, what that would look like with PECBIO. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Jonas Korlak. I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank LabRoots today for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available on demand viewing through August 2017. Keep an eye out for an email with LabRoots alerting you to this webcast and how it will be available for replay. We encourage you to forward the announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us and hope we see you next time.